Funding for Georgia Outdoors has been made possible in part by grants from the Georgia Natural Resources Foundation, from the Emlay Foundation, and from viewers like you. This is a bobwhite quail. It isn't just any bird. Quail hunting may be the most romantic sport of the South, with rules of etiquette and large plantations that revolve around this one species. But this bird needs a little help. Let us begin with an old-time hunt. In the tradition of plantation quail hunts, a guide leads a horse-drawn cart that carries both hunters and dogs. It is the dogs that find the quail. Once a bird dog goes on point, the hunter knows quail are somewhere hiding in the brush. A good dog will freeze in that position, sometimes for hours, until it gets the command to move out. When the dog or the guide flushes the covey, that's what a group of quail is called, it is impossible to predict where the birds will fly. When they scatter, it is a true test of the hunter's ability and part of the reason this sport is so popular. Whoa! Hey, hey. Samara Plantation, located in southwest Georgia, stays booked during quail season. Quail hunting is a huge economic boost for the region, and Samara is one of many hunting lodges that offer this long-established experience. These hunts are closely associated with properties in the Albany area and in a region known as the Red Hills that stretches from South Georgia to North Florida. It all began decades ago when wealthy industrialists discovered what was then a secret place in the Deep South. It was a hunter's dream come true. Ducks, deer, and quail all in abundance, living in rich forests of longleaf pine. These businessmen kept news about this special area, low key, no desire for competition. They fled here to avoid illnesses that seemed to accompany the dampness and heavy snow in America's Northeast and Midwest. Railroads carried these millionaires to the balmy climate of Southern Georgia. The rail line ended at a small, friendly town called Thomasville. Thomasville, Georgia soon became a refuge for the rich, even referred to as one of the top winter resorts on three continents. Even today, businesses that cater to the elite are not surprised to have customers with last names like Vanderbilt or visitors from the White House. There were some uh, wealthy um, people from the North 
Cleveland that came in here to Thomasville and they were looking for timber and other resources and discovered wildlife here and just so happened that the Bob White quail that was here was the, the bird of choice and they came down and they hunted. Plus there was, there was a lot of turkeys and deer and it was rural, it was hard to get to and for some reason it just happened that all their friends had to have a piece of Thomasville, Georgia and this, it evolved into this today a hundred and something years later. This was the southern terminus of the railroad track at that time. So this is as far south as they could go on the train. So you had a lot of them coming down on trains at that time in their own private cars. And since Thomasville was the terminus of the railroad track, they came here. They originally came because they thought the Pioneer was great for health. Uh, but they discovered there was a little five and a half ounce bird, the Bob White Quail. There are about 80 quail plantations around Thomasville, many of them owned by people who keep a low profile. It is the ability to disappear from public life that appeals to those who own these properties. This is where Jackie Kennedy came for peace and solitude when President Kennedy was assassinated. Both Presidents McKinley and Eisenhower enjoyed hunting vacations here. Former Vice President Dick Cheney has been shopping on Main Street. Thomas Drugstore has served many of them and still keeps all the old prescriptions in dusty boxes that fill a room. Family members protect special notes of importance like this one from Mamie Eisenhower. Dear friends at Thomas Drugstore, thank you for again remembering me with my favorite candy, Russell Stover. I shall place your fully Christmas-wrapped gift under our Yule tree. It is good to be back in Thomasville again. I wish you all a happy holiday season and a prosperous 1963. Sincerely, Mamie Dowd Eisenhower. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor had prescriptions filled here. And, you know, like that, we've had uh, Miss Kennedy, Jackie Kennedy, has visited this drugstore. And so it's names like that, and we, uh, President McKinley, he was, before he became president, he was uh, on campaigning or getting ready to become president or running for president, but he had prescriptions filled here also. So it's, uh, you know, names like that. Millionaires come in the door all the time. We, they, those people just always use Thomas Drugstore, and they walk in freely. They usually call Thomasville the village. <laughs> But they come in all the time, and most of them are the nicest folks. One little bird is largely the reason they came and still come. It is also the reason this ecological treasure was never developed. Northerners arrived as the South was trying to rebuild after the Civil War. Cash was short, and land was cheap. The wealthy purchased thousands of acres in the Red Hills region. They built huge winter estates and maintained the land around them for hunting. Quail thrive in these pine savannas. Large stands of old growth longleaf pine exist today only because those who purchased the land did not need it for the timber or farming. Even so, this type of territory and thus the little quail have largely disappeared from other parts of North America. Bob White quail populations have dropped more than 90% since 1966. That falls in line with the fragmentation of longleaf pine forests. These open canopy type forests once covered more than 90 million acres from southern Virginia to Florida and west through Louisiana and Texas. Today, less than four million acres of these forests remain. Patches of ecosystems scattered about. The trees produce high quality lumber and those that weren't cut for timber in the 20s were cleared for farms or developments. They are slow growing trees that can live more than 300 years, but may take a century or more to reach maturity. Georgia biologist Reggie Thaxton says a lot is riding on the ability to restore this habitat. The, the quail is the bird that, that brings in the money 
um, from hunting, but, but the same kind of land the quail need is needed by so many other species that are also in danger. That's right. That whole, we call them grassland obligates, those, those early successional birds, it's, and, and other critters too, gopher tortoises, for example, flatwood salamanders. It's really that guild of species, that whole group, that are in greatest decline of any single guild or group of species. And it's just because uh, the habitat has changed through time by the way we use land these days to produce food, fiber, and places to live. Tall Timbers Research Station, just over the border in Tallahassee, Florida, is trying to improve the numbers for all those species by better understanding the lifespan of a quail. It is daybreak. You can hear them call to each other. That is a covey call. But listen. This is where the bird got its name. Bob, Bob White? Bob White? Many people grew up hearing that call, but as rural areas were developed, the song disappeared. Researchers now hope to bring back that sound. This morning, fencing is set up to capture quail chicks and tag them. Trying to catch one of these chicks is like chasing a grasshopper. It's a 10 day old quail chick. If you hold them by the legs, you gotta hold them up real high on the legs. They're so cute. Mm -hmm. Quail chicks are defenseless and have many predators, including fire ants. So understanding why some live and others die is critical to the research. Each one is weighed in a baby sock, then gets a little metal tag clipped on its wing. This bird will henceforth be known as number 142159. It doesn't weigh hardly anything. It doesn't affect their movement or flight. Um, a lot of these will stay on their entire life. We have four-year-old birds that still have these wing tags on them. Um, like I said earlier, we put out about 200 of them a year. So we catch 200 of these chicks like this. The chick will be released near the parent, which is wearing a radio transmitter. Tall Timbers began the banding program in 1966 then added radio transmitters so they could follow movements of the adults. The radio tags last anywhere from uh, six to six months to, to 12 months. And so we, we track them, um, depending on the project, we'll track them multiple times a day or just a few times a week and get all sorts of information, but mainly survival and reproductive information. What we do is we put um, these, they're approximately six gram radio tags on on a subsample of all our birds we capture. And uh, we always try to put a, a radio tag on a bird that weighs at least 132 grams. It is rare to see a quail this close. They are part of the chicken family and stay close to the ground most of the time. The male has white under the chin and a white streak or eye patch. Females have the same marking in a yellowish brown or buff color. By counting the primary flight feathers, researchers know the age of a bird. This one, with five and a half feathers, is about six weeks old. Tall Timbers has the oldest banding program in the country, with more than 40,000 quail tagged and another 20,000 with radio transmitters. So what they're doing here is, is fitting the radio tag to the bird. And so what they want to do is, is it be kind of tight when it goes over the head. That kind of 
helps to ensure that the radio tag is not going to fall off. Tall Timbers actually invented the radio tags for quail. Uh, primarily, we find out habitat use, survival rates, where they nest, how they nest, all that sort of information. It works spectacular. It's expensive, and you have to radio a couple hundred a year to get the kind of information you want, but it does work well. One of the things that we learned way back was the importance of prescribed fire to keep the habitat right for quail. The late Southern conservationist Herbert Stoddard was among the first to encourage landowners to set their property on fire so small hardwoods and shrubs would burn and sun could reach the forest floor. The birds need ground cover, but if it's too dense, they have trouble running from predators. The fire helps longleaf pine survive without competition from hardwoods and shrubs, and quail follow suit. Stoddard began calling quail the firebird. Though burning was controversial at the time, most quail plantations now utilize that practice on a regular basis. But you don't have to be a plantation owner to help with the effort to restore quail populations. Private property owners and farmers are learning new ways to manage their lands. Richard Van is a retired banker who loved to hunt quail on the plantations around Thomasville. A biologist with the Bob White Quail Initiative convinced him he could have quail to hunt in his own backyard. Richard owns a lot of farmland. Where you see trees, there used to be cattle grazing. He let trees replace grass, then created borders around his cropland that now serve as quail habitat. He also sets his land on fire. So is this the kind of grass that you would burn, that you would want to get rid of? Definitely, what, definitely. What's wrong with it? Well, it's, it's too thick, and um, when um, mature quail and little quail get in here and they start trying to manipulate and move through here and, and this grass starts moving, it doesn't take the smartest hawk in the world to see that something's going on down there yeah, on the ground. Yeah, so the grass and, is moving down here and the hawk's... And he's, and he's saying, you know, there's something going on down there and so he can swoop down. We, you and I talked about Cooper's hawks, but there are other kinds, I would imagine, that can see this and they make a meal out of the little little babies or the or the mature and the wow. and the mothers trying to walk along there trying to get them through this stuff and so it's it's just it's not good. You want to burn it, you want to spray it, you want to do whatever you can to get it out so that you can get these briars to come up and other native grasses. Biologists came to Richard's land and mapped out a plan with borders around his fields that back up to pine trees. He has created natural quail habitat. I'm just so into it that I just, I can't help and I think I've got to do some things to keep them fed and, and do some things to, to give them good habitat and so I'm just all into it. Public lands are also in the game. New management techniques employed by the Department of Natural Resources are working at Dye Lane Plantation near Augusta, giving hunters like Carol Allen and his grandson an affordable way to harvest quail. And it's just so satisfying to be able to take him a place that he has an opportunity, you know, to harvest quail like I did growing up. And that, that's real satisfying. Georgia is a leader in the national plan to connect corridors of private and public lands and make them suitable quail habitat. The obvious thought may be, well, quail are gone because of too much hunting. But biologists agree, this is not an issue of over-harvesting. The problem is loss of habitat. Is it just Georgia? I mean, quail used to be all, of, all across the southeast, right? I mean, That's not... correct, yeah. Quail have, Bob White quail have declined throughout their range, which uh, at one time was all or parts of 35 states. And now there is a national Bob White Conservation Initiative plan that covers 25 states. And so other states, uh, not just in the deep southeast, but in the Midwest and even out to Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas, are in the process of doing what we're doing here in Georgia, stepping that national plan down to the state level and down to the ground level.
to restore habitat for Bob Whites in the other states as well. So we've all worked on this collectively in Georgia. Our wildlife agency in Georgia has been a leader in the development of that national movement. And that means a lot to you because no offense, but you're quail nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you grew up hunting quail as a kid, and, and so it means something really special to you. Bob Whites are special to me. They, they brought me to the conservation dance. My dad was an avid quail hunter, and he was a great father. And I went, the first quail hunt I remember, I was four years old. And every Saturday, every holiday, uh, and every chance we had in between those, we were out quail hunting. And it developed a bond between my father and myself that lasted to the day he died. And uh, I never remember a day in my life without bird dogs. And uh, yes, they're special. They are a special bird, and they're our state game bird, our designated state game bird, and uh, really a rich part of Georgia's wildlife culture and heritage. And you were talking about the, the dogs. Come here, baby. Come here. Come. The dogs are so important to everyone. It's, it, it, it's like a special dog, and I don't want to get them over here in those ants. No, no, she's fine. This is Polly. Yep, she is a one-year-old dog, so she's just learning. But dogs are what make it to me. Reggie echoes a sentiment you hear from most hunters. This is the first day Tall Timbers president, Bill Palmer, is training his puppy. He uses a quail wing, the way you might play with a cat. So this is a big part of quail hunting. Oh, it's everything about oh, quail hunting. It's so cute. Most bird hunters really love the sport because of the dogs. If it wasn't for the dogs, I don't think I'd be into it. Really? Absolutely. They're part of the family. They're part of the fun. Watching them grow, uh, become great hunters and wise of the way of the bird. So he's, it's just he's as much of a hunter as you are. Well, yeah. Or he will I be. follow him. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be shooting at any quail. So he's the hunter, I'm the shooter. Watching hunters and dogs being in beautiful forests, it seems ironic that the tiny bird that built Thomasville is in trouble. This species represents a way of life as much as an ecosystem. The culture of Thomasville still revolves around the sport of hunting. Whoa! Whoa! I'm not ready. People come from all over. You'll have people from England, you'll have people from Spain, you'll have guests that come in from Central America and South America, all over the Northeast, Texas, California. We have guests in Thomasville, and, 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 and literally, you never know during quail season who walks in our store, and it's very special. We've had presidents here, we've had vice presidents here, we've had dignitaries, we have military brass, we've had corporate executives. I mean, it's just, it's across the gambit who visits Thomasville and comes here to go quail hunting. One little bird holds us all together, and, and that little bird brings us all together. Uh, it, it's, we see each other in restaurants, we see each other riding horses and hunting together, we see each other at, at balls and, and lunches and breakfasts and shopping up and down the streets, I mean, and it's all because of that little bird. I mean, here we are. Well, it's a wonderful sporting bird, but it's just an amazing little guy that, uh, you know, the fact that how they covey and survive in the habitat and they're explosive on the flush. I don't know, there's just something endearing about them. You know, you hunt them and you enjoy them, they're sporty, but then I really like them all year round. I mean, when you see them with their broods and the chicks and et cetera, uh, it's just amazing that a bird that hatches out the size of your thumb can survive out here with everything in the world wanting to eat it. It's a, it's a tough little bird. Conservationist Herbert Stoddard said, I have learned that without nature, man has nothing. 
and my greatest desire would be satisfied if I could know that my grandchildren and their children after them will develop a love and understanding and an appreciation of the natural world. They can find no greater satisfaction in life. The twist in this show is that quail hunting is about so much more than just the hunt. It is the means by which some of the most precious land in the South has been protected and the species that live there have a chance at survival. I'm Sharon Collins. We'll see you next time. Funding for Georgia Outdoors has been made possible in part by grants from the Georgia Natural Resources Foundation, from the Emley Foundation, and from viewers like you.